This week on To The Contrary. First, women advancing to combat roles. Then, the Vatican wants women's views included in Catholic theology. Behind the headlines, Islam and the West. One woman seeks common ground. Bonnie or Bay, welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, women in combat. Women are one step closer to becoming Army Rangers. Five out of 26 female soldiers this week successfully completed the first phase of Ranger training. Up to now, women haven't been allowed to take the two-week course. Military policy only allows men to serve as Rangers, but the Army is trying to open combat roles to women. The course eliminates a lot of men who take it, too. Just more than half of the men, versus almost one in five women, completed the course. The successful women face a subsequent course in April. Defense Secretary nominee Ashton Carter addressed the issue of women in combat in his Senate confirmation hearing this week, saying he's open to engaging female soldiers and will evaluate existing and future standards. So, Megan Byer, will we see women Army Rangers anytime soon? Well, I hope so. This is really just policy catching up with reality. Yeah, I hope so. I think we're moving in that direction. I think by them passing, these five women passing that exam, I think there's definitely good hope that they can reach that point. They've just broken some barriers for the rest of us, so I think that's great. Whatever women want to do, we should see them in. Uh, this was like a really tough course. Anybody who can get through it, I say they ought to be able to be an Army Ranger. Okay, so nobody here thinks it's a bad idea. Have we gotten to that point? We're <laughs> <laughs> reliably, no, we're all you know, on the same page. Uh, assume <laughs> the conservatives think it's a bad idea. No, I, so what's happened among conservative women that... You know, <laughs> 10, 20 years ago, women in combat was a bad idea, and now you youngins are uh, are saying it's a good Isn't idea. Isn't it great to hear somebody oh, call wow, you a youngin? I That's a <laughs> <laughs> you know what I would say, though, I think part of it, one thing that, that conservatives, a variety of people, I think, always were concerned about was, you know, especially when you look at these combat roles and you look at the kind of thing, the training that you have to go through, would they ever say we've got to lower standards, physical yeah. standards or the like, to say that more women, that we're going to say it's got to be 50-50? And that's a concern, frankly, that I always had. If you're not going to lower the standards, I mean, look, what Army Rangers do is tough stuff. I mean, there's a lot of different combat roles that don't require the same amount of physical activity. But if it requires a certain amount of physical activity, you've got to be able to get through it. And I don't want them to lower the bar. Just to get because to they're kind of And the women don't want that either. Right. Because well, then, hopefully not. Yeah. And I think what really, you, you did get some pushback with the, the military, too, when they were saying, can we include women in these combat situations? You know, is the military guy going to trust the gal to have his back? I think those were a lot of the concerns that the military raised, whether they were conservative or liberal, but they were raising those concerns. And I, so I think the Secretary of Defense, um, you know, Ashton Carter, will. I think they're going to lay it all out and see what happens. And what they've seen is that they have had these female combat units working side by side with these men. And I think if the woman wants to go out there and be in direct combat, which I think is one of the toughest jobs any American can do, you know, I think they should be, well, be able to have that opportunity. And I wonder, there was also a concern I remember being voiced on the right side of the, the stage, right side of the, <laughs> of the uh, table, which was that what, ha you know, if men are captured and they're sexually tortured, who cares? Or, or uh, let me, not sure. who cares, but that the American public could tolerate that. But if women Fuck. soldiers are captured and raped, the American public wouldn't be able to tolerate that. Has that changed? No, I, I, just, I don't think so. But I think we all recognize war is hell. And the women who've signed up for this understand that as well. But, you know, I think we also need to recognize that this idea that women are not on the front lines is, is a false idea. That we have had uh, 800 casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan, 130 deaths on the part of these women. And women this who were on, on the front lines because they were well, serving are. in soup kitchens on yeah, the front lines. Yeah, or, or driving a truck or with these, you know, right. the way that, that these wars are playing out anywhere you are exactly. in these zones, you're on it's the front lines. It's not just combat. Look at Laura Logan. She was gang raped in Egypt, just covering the Tahrir Square, you know, when Mubarak fell. So, I mean, that's n women in journalism. So it's really across and, the board. And, and have we, with terrorism, has terrorism 
I hate to say this, but inured us to the difference between slaughtering men getting slaughtered Look, and women getting I think getting you saw slaughtered. that Jordanian, I mean, right, the, Jordanian this pilot being burned this week. Whether that was a man or woman, that yeah. was the most atrocious no, but the barbaric war, the, act. The, that in but turn, the it, it, no, no, no. The Jordanians had a Muslim woman or, yes. or self-proclaimed Muslim woman who was a terrorist, and she was Te she was uh, executed. And no, but there was no That's right. outcry. A terrorist is a terrorist is a terrorist. Whether woman or man, if they're out there to kill people, uh, they should be executed. So I think that it's that you have to be gender neutral on terrorism, definitely. That's right. Right. But you know what, uh, you can uh, kind of liken this to the P&L jobs in uh, the corporate world, that there are a lot of women serving who they can't even be written up for doing these kinds of jobs because they're not supposed to be on the front line. So once we change the policy and women can take some of these roles, it'll be on their record. And now there's really kind of a funny position that the chain of command has because they don't write up some of the stuff because the women aren't supposed to be on the front lines. Well, and once, when, when. And they don't get credit for it in their career path. Right. Well, they get, instead of combat pay, they get some other kind of pay. That they get the equal pay, but again, it, the promotion isn't there. Yeah. But once women are Army Rangers, how far is it before we have female Marines? Well, I, I, I don't know. That's a question. I mean, I don't think any of these scenarios are exactly the same. The four different divisions are not exactly the same. Army, Air Force, Marines, they all have different qualifications, different roles that they play. And I think each one has to be looked at very carefully as we go into this and make sure that we don't lower standards, uh, that we that we don't change the rules or the games in a way just to fit this new policy as opposed to what's going to make us have the strongest and the most and and the most powerful military force in protecting this country because that impacts men and women and children we have to keep that should be our first and foremost not gender equality and roles. ensure that the military is ready to ha manage the mental side of it so when women do go into direct con combat are they going to have the ability to deal with post-traumatic stress disorder? I spoke with a Marine that had been both in, I in Iraq and Afghanistan. He goes, you talked to my wife for two years when I came back. I'm telling you I was impossible to deal with. Again, these serious issues that That's the military right. needs to be prepared to manage both for men and women. Well, Lisa's yeah. wife was still alive. A lot of them come ho back home and often get into terrible domestic violence situations. So I think post-traumatic stress order training for everyone. But I wonder, you know, there there are problems with the sexual assault in the military. Yeah. There, are, it's sort of impossible to tell whether it's more or less prevalent in the military than in society at large. What about sexual assault on the front lines? Do we know anything about r rates of that? Is it going to be less because? you're worried about getting shot at? Well, aren't it, isn't it currently more men that are getting assault, sexually assaulted in the military? Perce not it's numerically, like the... but percentage-wise. Yeah. But some of this is new, Bonnie. I mean, so, I mean, you haven't had as many women on the front lines or in this kind of position, so we don't yeah. know yet. But I do think this is one of the areas that I still have a concern as a conservative and as American, which is putting men and women in close quarters uh, is can be challenging. And, you know, I think we need to look at whether or not that has to be the case in every... Maybe yeah. you can be on the front lines, but it doesn't mean you have to be sleeping next to the bunk of a guy if you're a woman. Unless and he's a real handsome single Marine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but that's going to get you looked in trouble. I think it's more, that. though, about... <laughs> power than it is about gender when it comes to that. All right. There's a lot of power. <laughs> Let us know what you think. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie Urbe and at To The Contrary. From the battlefield to religious battles. The Vatican held its first conference this week to discuss women's issues as part of a broader outreach by Pope Francis to make the church hierarchy more open to female Catholics and their concerns. But critics are skeptical the church will move forward on important issues such as ordination of women. They say the conference is run by men who ignore controversial topics. The initiative faced a rocky launch when a video produced by the Vatican went viral, but not for the reasons the Holy See anticipated. The ad features an Italian actress urging women to post videos on the internet about their experiences as Catholics. It has been widely ridiculed as sexist. The backlash was so fierce, the Vatican took it down. But some say anything beats nothing, and the head of one Catholic women's group said, quote, this a crumb instead of the usual absence of said crumb. <laughs> so what's better, Mercy, a crumb or no crumb? <laughs> You know, I like the whole piece of bread here, but no, uh, I think for uh, what's interesting about this conference is the fact that Pope Francis really is talking about these issues of family and marriage and talking about the role of women 
in the church, not only in the church, but in your ordinary life every day as you live as a Catholic. And in my, with talking to my sources, what I've learned is that they did pull together this committee of leading women that were in the media, in science, in theology, to basically assist the cardinals and assist the Pope in providing this report and providing the backgrounder um, for this conference. So I think this is an opportunity to present this information to the Pope and for them to then decipher what are the next moves in terms of the church. Okay, but and nobody in the world, I don't think, who follows this Pope at all wouldn't say that he's an incredible man and he's really changing the church in, in very positive ways, especially this week also telling everybody, look, you've got to be open. We've got to get rid of this cancer of the pedophilia, priest yeah, pedophilia right, scandal, right. and we've got to be open, open the records and, and you know, be make amends, make amends right. and get sure. beyond it. Okay, but on women, well, what they now he's you know he's made progress in ter in terms of gays, in ter at least in terms of his public pronouncements. But you have a conference where you don't talk about abortion, where you don't talk about ordination of women. Uh, how this is much what they, progress? This is how is that? they came up with the agenda. So they took it out to the diocese, where the diocese then basically interviewed, talked to women that belong to the Catholic Church. And guess what issues dominated in this? It was poverty, lack of education, lack of a job opportunity for women, domestic violence, all these issues that w we all care about. So for them, the ordination of women actually didn't pop up as one of the main uh, one of the main topics. So it's something that they followed based on the diocese reports in which they interviewed women within the Catholic Church throughout the world, and those were the topics that came up. On the ordination of women, the teaching is the same. The popes, time and time again, has said that that's not going to change, at, at least for what we see for now. And so they're going to move on in with talking about the role of women in terms of how they relate in culture and our society today. Uh, you know, and the, the title said it all. It's uh, uh, Equality and Differences. Okay. And I think, uh, you know, it was the camel's nose under the tent. They're talking about women again in the Catholic Church. That's a very good thing. In the 70s, when all the other churches decided they would give a path to leadership to women, you saw a lot of women leave the Catholic Church, you know, the convents emptied out. And you know, I think that that had a, a dramatic impact on the Catholic Church and its orientation in America, the loss of those wonderful women who did care about the poor and uh, brought all of those issues to the church. And, and I think people f feel that Pope Francis is bringing some of that back. I think they should talk about divorce, they should talk about birth control, they should talk about I think Which they talked about at the conference did. of the family. Oh, that's true. Because he's told everyone the Catholics need to stop reading like rabbits. Well, Feel he like also they have talked about like that. But he also he said, said that. I yeah, did, he did. did and that. went back. He did go back and talk about the beauty <laughs> of a child and the beauty of large families. Hence, I'm the mother of five. So again, I, he did mention he had to backtrack on yeah. those comments because it was very offensive for people who really believe that each child deserves a life. You know, deserves to be brought to this world. So I think that he did have to push back. So he offended a lot of Catholics. He did offend, that. especially those that have a lot of family. <laughs> well, I didn't realize it was that clearly. Here, it wasn't here's the reality. I mean, I'm not Catholic, though I like Catholics. Thank <laughs> God, Jenny. <laughs> oh, so I like them too. I know. I know. I'm probably you more Catholic than a lot wait, of Catholics but wait, are. But one of my uh, two best friends is Catholic. Yeah. And so is says, mine. You can't not like Catholics without not liking America. America, one in five Americans is Catholic. No, that's, 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 that's true. the same but, thing. But I think you have to be careful. I mean, look, this is a pope who clearly has tried to talk about controversial issues in a very yeah, open he's way, trying. and I think that's great. But there's a difference between talking about them in an open way and throwing out your theology at the that's same right. time. And I think, you know, the truth is many people who would like Catholics to be pro-birth control and pro-abortion and be open to all the pro to, open to these things want someone to throw out the theology as well or change what the theology of the church is. And I don't see this pope doing that because that's not what popes tend to do. Um, but we'll see. To talk about issues, to try to say the church is open to discussing things is one thing, but at the same time to say we're going to change what we believe is a well, but let me the conversation has started. I'll have, I'll but let me ask you this. I mean, is it as th there are many schools of thought about Pope Francis, but there are people who say he's doing a great PR job. He's changing nothing. Will it be the same with women? I think you cannot underestimate the bully pulpit effect. And you know, he has made a tremendous difference. He is a breakthrough leader. He is creative destruction in a Pope mobile. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, um, I think what he, you cannot underestimate the symbolism and, uh, you know, the, the things that he has said. I mean, it's, it's but, created a great deal of interest on the part of people who've left the church. I agree. You know, under an, a different pope, I wouldn't be so optimistic. But this pope, I think maybe the crumb will lead to a loaf of bread. But I also do want to add that I am a Muslim, and the godmother to my daughter is Catholic. So there's lots of love for Catholics. Oh. At the <laughs> All right, behind the headlines. Are we witnessing a clash of civilizations between Islam and the West? Former UN official May Rahani says that's not the case at all. In fact, in her book, Cultures Without Borders, she argues we often fail to see the commonalities between cultures. I'm not saying, and I'll never say, that cultures are absolutely the same and that the East and the West is exactly the same. No, we should celebrate diversity. We should celebrate differences, but also, on equally importantly, we should also celebrate common ground and acknowledge it and value it. May Riani is former co-chair of the United Nations Girls Education Initiative. She says her work in dozens of countries made her realize there is more common ground within cultures than most realize. For example, all the parents anywhere in the world, be it in a country in Africa or be it in a country in the Middle East, or be it in Asia or Latin America or anywhere, or here in the US, they want the best for their children. They want their children to succeed, to be happy. Yet today we see many groups oppressing girls and denying them an education. Boko Haram in Nigeria and ISIS in Syria and Iraq are examples. Riani says this is because their leaders are opportunistically seeking power, not because they follow Islam. Those who want to gain power use the religion as a tool. And they tell them, your religion says so, so you have to obey me. Many Muslims cannot read Arabic or the Quran or other religious teachings, which are generally not translated. Riani recalls meeting Afghani leaders who followed an Islamic clergyman who forbid girls from getting an education. I told them I'm going to quote the hadith. The hadith is what the Prophet Muhammad says. These are sayings collected in a book, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. It's like the second book after the Quran. And I said, in the hadith, there is a saying that says, education is the responsibility of every Muslim man and every Muslim woman. And I said, I believe the prophet wrote every Muslim woman on purpose not to allow anybody to misinterpret him. That was deliberate. And I said, who do you follow, the mullah or the prophet? Riani says some religious leaders deliberately misinterpret Islam for their own gain. The mullah knows they cannot read these books. He can tell them anything he wants to gain more power and to control them. The extremist men recognize that education is transformative. When the girls get educated, they get transformed. They do not accept this imposition on them that they have to obey ridiculous rules. What can Americans do to help change oppressive cultures? Riani says foreign aid is key, but polls continue to show spending on foreign aid is relatively unpopular among Americans. When the funds are spent well on basic issues such as education and girls' education, benefits everybody. Benefits these countries that we talked about, but also benefits the U.S. Because the more you educate young girls and young boys, the less you have unemployed people, young men and young women, and the less unemployed people you have, the less violence you have. So what, aside from education and an appreciation for education, what do we have in common, the East and the West? I think we have so much in common. One thing is men across these organized religions need to stop telling women what our religious texts say. And high five to Rihani. I think she's great. Um, but there are many women who, who are, in the West view anyway, oppressed by Islam having to wear 
uh, niqabs or or veils or hijabs. They're such calm, and, yeah, you and, know. And they, and they will tell you, no, Islam treats women equally. When they're sitting there, staying out of the public eye, only going out when they're escorted by men, and having to cover themselves. Yeah, well, it's really difficult. There's 1.7 billion Muslims in the world, and we are generalized and lumped together all the time. I mean, a lot of Muslims probably watching the show are probably like, why is this Bengali, Americanized Muslim even talking about anything? Can you believe her daughter has his godmother? <laughs> so it's very, I mean, this is my issue, okay? We can't be lumped together, but the U.S. plays a big role. Aside from foreign policy, um, there's actually a Foreign Aid Reform Act that's kind of sitting, uh, and there's a lot to be done, but I know it makes Americans really nervous to hear about increased U.S. funding to anything. A lot of great programs are in place, and there's hundreds of different kinds of State Department programs. And it's not new. It's yeah, not new. It's not the new. The Marshall Plan was a peace program based on the, just World that, War II to repair. Yeah, after yeah. World War II to but build up But it's working with faith-based leaders on the ground that really kind of started these State Department programs in the Bush era and have continued under Obama. I would say redirect that funding to women's groups and secular groups because blanket funding in the Muslim world to faith-based leaders, some quote-unquote moderate mullahs are just taking the cash and running. Well, this is the problem with government funding of just about everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> is that it's not that people are, for example, opposed to education or opposed to the nation's military or opposed to helping other countries. Countries, the problem is the money often isn't spent well. And mm -hmm. so we say we want to do this with it, but then that doesn't happen. Uh, that doesn't mean that people are against all foreign aid. But I think another thing on this, I mean, to the point of, on the religious side here, look, the fact that people can read their religious text is really important. Yeah. And then if they decide that they're okay with, if you're Muslim, wearing veils, that's their decision. Yes. Just as in this country, if a woman, if you're Catholic and you decide, you know what, I'm okay with churches teaching on birth control, you have that right to believe that. Can I and tell people you? shouldn't say you're being oppressed by that, but you need to be able to know what your religion says. You need says. to be able to access your text. When That's I first right. came to the States, you know, for college, people were shocked that as a Muslim, I have not read the the Quran. But, you know, growing up and before 9-11 um, and everything, mullahs were our translators. Literally, these illiterate Bengali old men who were very abusive. My, my parents had to fire like a mullah a week. But they would tell you what the Quran was saying. And if you didn't, everything was memorization. And if you didn't memorize a prayer, right, they would like reach across the table and slap you. They were sexist and abusive. Oh my God. But you know what, the point <laughs> Clearly that they just making, got worse over the years. But, 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 but you know, I, I want to bring in, there was a video that went viral this week to more, last time I checked, two and a half million views of Western young women putting on hijabs and going out in public and seeing what it was like. Yeah. Um, and I want, is that, did you, have you seen I it? Haven't seen I haven't it. seen it. What was it but, like? You know, <laughs> this is the point she's making, tolerance, you know, to, to uh, this idea that we've got to start focusing on what we have in common, which is a lot. And some of the, you know, in the wake of what happened in Paris, so many of the imams have said, listen, this is not what our religion is about. These are extremist fundamentalists of which the Christian faith has and every religion has, but they don't represent our religion, which is all about peace and right. love and caring. And uh, there was a mosque that opened just this week in LA, a women's mosque. Yeah. And uh, I just talked because to they got sick. back. They got sick of being discriminated against yeah, by the men's all women mosque. mosque, and they yeah. can lead prayer. I think we need to do more and, of that. And the women who Exclude started it said, well, <laughs> when I grew up and I was hearing, uh, you know, it was all being translated to me, uh, and then I read the Quran myself, I realized this is a wonderful religion that I want to interpret, and so that's what they're doing at this mosque. The first prayer meeting was last Friday, they're doing it once a month now. But it is LA. about bringing the different religions together to have that discussion. This is what America's about. I mean, we are that melting pot that's of all right. these religions. And so I find that, you know, when you do have the fact that you don't have an opportunity to, you know, talk to a, to a Muslim or to a Catholic and really try to understand where their faith is coming from, and the goodness of their faith. Now you have, in the case of Islamic, the Islamic State, obviously the Taliban, et cetera, where their power and their ult absolute power is so destructive. And, and so for people that are non-Muslim to say, well, why aren't the Muslim community standing up against Islamic State and, and saying what they're doing is absolutely wrong? And, yeah. and you know, the response well, because that a lot... because it's kind of crazy, because a lot of these Muslim extremists were created and armed, let's not forget, I mean, but what's hello, the ultimate... Mujahideen and the Taliban by yes. the U.S. Yeah. government to get the Soviets out of, the, out of Afghanistan way back in 1979. We can't forget it. So, yeah, we have a lot of responsibility to be like, these guys are crazy, but it can't also be like, where'd they come from?
Yeah. They're not all. Well, it's, not, it's not where they came from. It's where, where the, the weaponry and the like came from. And there's no argument, I don't think. But, but, and when but, but vacuums were created where terrorism always. Well, there's vacuum right now in Iraq because they've pulled right. all these troops out of Iraq. Thanks to President Obama. Yes, so but yeah. had we never gone, he's to blame. We're, we're, <laughs> we're out of time, and why don't they make weapons that self-destruct after they get turned over to somebody else? That's it for this edition. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week. Thank you.